Ladies and gentlemen, dreamers and doers, seekers of purpose and fulfillment, welcome to Passion on Purpose, the podcast that sets your soul on fire and ignites the spark within you. I'm your host, Steph Hilfer, and I'm beyond thrilled you're here. Passion on Purpose features leaders, experts, and sometimes me on center stage. We put the spotlight on visionaries, entrepreneurs, leaders, experts, and everyday heroes to share their journey of self-discovery, enthusiasm, and unwavering determination. We'll explore how they use their passion and purpose to fuel their brand. Alongside our leaders, we'll provide practical tips, actionable advice, and wisdom from our experts across various fields. So if you're ready to unleash your inner fire, shake off the doubts and insecurities, and pursue a life of purpose with unbridled enthusiasm, then let's dive in. Hi guys, we are back for a season three experts on center stage episode. I am so excited for this season's Passion on Purpose podcast, the lineup of experts that I have been really just hand selecting or hand, you know, reaching out to have been people that are in my world in a way that's really meaningful and pertinent to what I have going on. And so when um, I was going through, actually several of my close friends and family are going through cancer scares, cancer battles, um, cancer continuation battles. And so like this idea of cancer in our world is ever present. It's also hitting me really close to home. Um, And so I was very fortunate in the last 10 years of my life to have some knowledge around alternative cancer screening methods And in my last, gosh, what, two, three weeks ago, um, after hearing some of my closest friends going through some scary things right now, I took it upon myself to go get a thermography scan. And if you don't know what that is, we are going to make sure you know by the end of the episode. But what I wanted to share with you is that while I was waiting in the waiting room, there was this beautifully stunning book just staring me in the face, bright, colorful, engaging. I, I couldn't not look at it. And when I saw that book, um, thermography, the fibrocystic and dense breast, a radiation free survival guide for happy, healthy breasts. I knew as soon as I got in the room with my thermographist or thermo, we'll, we'll figure out the right term, but my clinician, I knew I had to find out the author, find out who the author is, how do I get a hold of her, and how do I bring her on my show? And that is exactly what we did today. So today we have Patricia Bowden, Lu- Bowden Lucardi. Um, Tr- Patricia told me to say it with a Southern accent and it'll come out cleaner, but <laughs> we know I'm not good at accents. Um, and so Patricia and I had the chance to talk several times. Um, we've had the chance to fumble through technology and get our feathers ruffled. So we, we're, we're best friends now, basically, right? If you, if you go through <laughs> technology struggles with someone, you just have a deeper connection <laughs> with them. So, um, I'm so excited to introduce Patricia to, talk with you about a few things. And as we do on our expert episodes, I know it's a lot of me at the beginning, but on these episodes, I want to make sure you guys know where we're going in this conversation. They are a little longer. These episodes are longer because there's so much expert depth and value that our experts bring. So I want to give you a few highlights of where this conversation is intended to go. Okay. You're going to want to stay for this. So um, first of all, um, Lululemon, hello. Hot, hot name that a lot of my listeners, especially people in my world, we know that brand. Um, there's a lot of controversy in what's happening with some of the chemicals and some of the products going on in their clothing. Um, you know, so we're going to talk about what that is, what's going on with that. Um, you know, every, everyone who comes on the show has their own expertise and knowledge and experience with things. Um, and so we're going to get her perspective on what's going on with that. We're also going to talk about this increase in hysterectomies that are kind of like the trending new thing you ask for, like like NyQuil on a shelf, hysterectomy is behind the, the shelf as well. You just pick one up and take it home. Kind of talking about that trend and whether or not that's safe and whether or not that's the route we should be going with our healthcare. Um, also, there's a lot of lawsuits and bras. Um, huge topic, huge industry. Um, as we know, you know, that industry isn't always built to favor and be for us. So let's learn a little bit about what's going on with the lawsuits there. And then that's a lot to cover. We have one more point we're going to try to squeeze in is why in the world is the increase, is there an increase in breast cancer in our younger women? What can we do about it? Why is it happening? 
Um, we're just going to dive on in because that's a lot to cover. Hi, Patricia. How are Hi. you? How are you? Yes, we got to that technology with a few of the F bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just a few. <laughs> a few. Well, we speak French, don't we? So there we go. Exactly. That's As I said, at the pa on the Passion on Purpose podcast, when we get passionate, we don't know what's going to come out of our mouth. So, and I right. can only imagine with these topics, we're going to get passionate. So mm -hmm. um, first off, share with me a little bit about how did you get into thermography? You, uh, you're an author of a book that is helping so many men and women in the world. How, tell me like kind of the highlights of your career and what you're passionate about getting out there today. Well, my background is, is pretty interesting. I worked in the beauty industry and I did hair and makeup professionally for models. And so part of me was always like, wow, we're giving a woman a false bill of goods. You know, there's retouching, there was tape that held the breast up. And I mean, crazy like that, you know, and I did that for many, many years. And, but the interesting thing at, when we were having our lunch break or we were traveling on location, we always ended up talking about health. So when I left the industry, cause I started getting booked for, um, pharmaceutical commercials and i said i don't need to make money this bad <laughs> so i just i said that's it no more no more editorial i'm not going to do pharmaceutical drugs so i ended up um, going back to school to become a massage therapist and i taught kundalini yoga so i was always interested in health and i got hired at canyon ranch medical spa alongside mark hyman who's an amazing functional medicine doctor and i was a breath educator and i ended up leaving to become a thermographer. Now I'm a breast educator. I went from breath to breast. But um, I've been doing this for 12 years. I have a private practice in the city. And I will tell you the one thing I have noticed, and it's actually on the cover of my book, most women don't know their own anatomy, particularly when it comes to their breast. They hear words like fibrocystic breast, um, fibroadenoma, um, estrogen dominance, um, uh, cyst calcifications, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Esther, what does this mean? This is the lay of the land. And if they're listening to mainstream medicine, chances are they're going to want to do a biopsy. They're going to do multiple mammograms. Um, and so the reason I wrote my book is that in two days, I had nine patients that had fibrocystic dense breast, dense breast, and they were over biopsy. They were over radiated. They had chips left in them. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is an industry. I have, to, I have to, I have to start, I have to write a book about this. This is an industry. And some of these women were only 40 and they've already had three mammograms. Back up on that one. They're getting mammograms in their 30s. As one doctor said, I to radiate a woman before the age of 50 is unethical. Mm. Radiation is cumulative. Our yeah. breasts are so precious with so many, so many functions in them, but to match them and radiate. And we can go off on that again, because that's another topic. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I want to go off on that because honestly, anyone listening is thinking, wait a minute, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? I, I, am, am I not being better by getting mammograms sooner? Am I not oh. being more proactive? Right. I got to imagine listeners are hearing this and thinking this is backwards yes. to what I've been taught. Yes, this is a gold standard. Okay. Thermography is a study of heat. And it's done with an infrared camera. It's physiology. You don't go to school and study just anatomy. You study anatomy and physiology, right? Well, they took the physiology out. This used to be covered by insurance. They took the prevention, early treatment out of our breast screening. And we only do anatomy. So once it's found on a mammogram, an MRI, an ultrasound, they have to treat it. So when one gets a mammogram, they're saying, oh, you have a clean bill of health. Keep coming back every year. And when it's big enough to be seen, we can treat it. That's not prevention. So again, it was covered by insurance and the mammography lobby decided to make this as the gold standard. We're one of the few countries in the world not using this. So um, with that being said, thermography has been around since the 50s. It's been used for espionage. Um, they're still using, in fact, the camera that I used to have, they are no longer doing medical, they're, they're doing espionage. It's more money in espionage. But there are two studies, and it was on the news for like two seconds, just like everything's on the news for two seconds. And it was two major studies on, on mammography, 25 year study and a 30 year study, um, a British medical journal and a journal of American medicine. They said, basically the harm outweighs the good. And in Switzerland, they have phased out mammograms. 
Now I hear they're going to phase them out in China. I don't know. Go figure about that. But um, it's particularly for dense breast. Again, that's why I wrote the book. I, I kind of skipped that part. Dense breasted women, their breasts on a mammogram are white. It's very whitey color and a tumor is white. And 49% of women, we have dense breasts. There's nothing wrong with having dense breasts. It just means there's more glandular tissue, more connective tissue. So what? But they said that women who have connect have, have dense breasts have a 75% increase in getting breast cancer. Yes, if they're using a mammogram because they can't see it. That means mm -hmm. they'll get a 75% chance that it's a false negative. So with that being said, there's as low as a 23% sensitivity on a mammogram with dense breasted women. Well, look at the math at 70 something percent um, failure rate and 80% of biopsies, this is National Institute of Health, are benign. Biopsies are a huge business in the breast industry, huge industry. And biopsies are one of the leading causes of metastatic cancer. They'll say, oh, there's a that hole in that needle is covered up, but hey, you're puncturing something and it's going to be released. And those little macrophages that are the part of the immune system, they're gonna come like, you know, Pac-Man to eat it up. But then they're, those, those whatever's been released is gonna jump on the back like hit, hitchhikers and it's taken around the body. So with that being said, dense breasted women have, they just can't be seen on a mammogram, but they will not, they don't want to allow a woman to just have an ultrasound. They want her to have a mammogram and then an ultrasound, knowing full well that it's not the best screening for a dense breasted woman. But thermography has no issues in looking at, at anatomy because it's looking at heat. Mm -hmm. So whatever's found on a mammogram, an MRI, an ultrasound, and it is unfortunately cancer, if you back that up into the stages of what's oh, called angioneogenesis or the beginning of a new blood supply that could take seven eight ten years before it coalesces into something big enough to be seen on an x-ray so now what i'm seeing women that are getting cancer in their 40s and 50s and i'm seeing a lot now and the other day i was on a podcast and i started crying because it hits so close to home i mean i have, I have daughters you know, this could be us, it could be our mothers, it could be our, our neighbors, it could be our coworkers, it could be our best friend. We're all women with breasts and we're living in such toxic times right now. So much petrochemicals that are out there. But if a woman is getting cancer in her late 30s, 40s and 50s, back up eight to 10 years. That means if she's getting cancer in her 40s, she was actually starting her cancer in her 30s. That's crazy and no one's talking about this. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Breast Cancer Awareness Month did not actually happen in October because it was created by a petrochemical company, the British Imperial Chemical Company that became AstraZeneca that has the two blockbusting drugs, Armatrex and Tamoxifen, that a woman has to take for five years. But they were created by a petrochemical company and Susan G. Coleman vehemently denies the link between BPA, phthalates and breast cancer. Well, at Duke University, they had breast cancer cells in a test tube and they were proliferating. Turns out that the BPA, the phthalates were leaching into the breast cancer cells. Mm -hmm. They were like gasoline on fire. So no more pink ribbon, rah, rah, find the cure. Interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because now the petrochemical company is on the radar, just like the Lulu Lemon or Lulu Lemon, how you want to call it. <laughs> I love the Lululemon. It just feels so fancy. Yes, it's kind of like uh, Henry Bendel's or Donna Caron. <laughs> or Target. <Well, I>, <laughs> or Target. I always like Target. Yes. I, I used to do hair and makeup for Target. Uh, they were good payers. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the petrochemical companies, it is amazing that what we're seeing, that this link between BPA and, and cancer or the... Um, the gender dysphoria, because these things all have foreign estrogens in them. Mm -hmm. And they're coming into our body like estrogens and they're parking on the receptor sites. And it's completely throwing our hormonal system out of balance. Yeah. And it's not just the human kingdom. It is the animal kingdom, the amphibian kingdom, the fish. We've had years now, male fish are becoming female because of all the estrogens in the ocean. That's so, insane. 
That is insane. The craziest one was in Florida, and I never get the name right. It's called Lake Apoca or Apacopa. And this was in a book called um, Countdown by Shanna Swan on the how the sperm count is dropping. Now it's down to 63.3% around the world, even in Africa. So the sperm count's going down. They found these crazy female alligators in the most toxic waters in Florida, and female alligators were growing penises. When you say toxic, that's chemicals like BPAs, like plastics that we're letting get into our everything, skin. pesticides, atrazine, everything. I everything mean, if you, know, if you know the Environmental Working Group, you know that's a, a great website to get the Dirty Does and the Delightful Twelve. And every year they say, you know, these are the safest vegetables to eat. If you're a mother trying to raise your kid, they tell you these are the products that don't have, you know, BPA and um, plastics in the children's toys and that sort of stuff. But green beans came on the market and they've never been on the market. Strawberries, blueberries and peaches have been on the top for over 25 years. Top good list or top the bad list, the bad um, list. A bad list. My daughter says, I don't even want to eat a strawberry. You've just made it so bad for me. I said, well, make sure it's organic. Yeah. You know, make sure it's organic. But Environmental Working Group is great. And there's other apps out there that you can get. And you can go into the store and, and actually point at something. They'll tell you what's in that product. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff out there. So I want to step back a little bit because we've we've kind of like bridged all of what I feel like we did was we went through like all the headlines of the scary stuff that we yes. all hear but then we're like okay where are the real claims in that where's the like reality of what I need to do with this information? yes absolutely and yeah, so the, fir the first step back is right we talked about thermography being an alternate or precursor type scan for um prevent not preventing cancer but finding cancer and we talked about how mammogram mammograms and ultrasounds or mammograms rather are the gold star here in america then we go to an ultrasound so right. let's just really focus on how is this thermography thing if it's so helpful and so such a great preventative or precursor screening tool why how does it work and why are we not more aware of it okay well, let's just look at the fact that our breasts are monetized. We live in a breast cancer is the biggest industry. Um, it's a $380 billion industry so far. Uh, no, that's sorry. That's mammograms. Um, I think it's a $70 billion industry. Mammograms are bigger industry. Um, again, thermography is just a study of heat. So anything that's that cancer is hot. So, you know, it's the beginning of inflammation. And it's coupled with an, uh, an ultrasound. It's not an alternative because it's anatomy and physiology together, like the yin and the yang, and the two go together. And, you know, if there's inflammation in a woman's breast, then, you know, they talk to one of our doctors and then we put them on a protocol. And there's wonderful things out there that our breasts thrive on, particularly the lymph system, which we'll talk about the lymph system. Uh, a majority of the women that I image in other thermographers, we see a backup of lymphatic uh, stagnation due to bras. And we see a lot coming from the oral cavity. I always ask my patients, do you sleep with a night guard, an Invisalign, or do you have root canals or amalgams? Because it drains down into the neck and into the breast. So thermography is, um, it's a prevention, but you get a lifetime image of what a woman's breast looks like right there. Mm -hmm. But that's great. So you know what it looks like right there, but you want to come back in six months. And a lot of women don't do that follow-up because you want to have a baseline. Let's just say if there's a closed vessel pattern, want to check that out six months later. Or let's just say there was a lot of estrogen dominance. And we'll talk about that, what that looks like. You go on a protocol, you take sulforaphane, you take the iodine, you take certain things, do lymphatic drainage, you come back in six months, your breasts have changed. And you can visually see the changes. Thermography is a study of heat, but thermogram means an image of heat. So you can actually see the before and after of how you're benefiting from it. Yeah. It's kind of a no brainer really. And all women really should start around the age of 20 because they're the ones that are out there doing the most to toxic stuff to their body. You know, they're at, they're putting on cosmetics and they're wearing all kinds of plastic clothing and they're getting all this stuff from around the world. You go online, you can get clothes for like, oh, you get $15 for 
pair of pants, but what are they made out of? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the fashion industry has become so toxic. So we have to look at what we're putting on our body, what yeah. we're putting on our skin. You know, I mean, even sleeping with um, toxic petrochemical underwear, mm-hmm. if it's not organic cotton, my, my gynecologist says, don't sleep with underwear. Mm-hmm. Let, your, let your yoni breathe. You know, <laughs> yonis actually means our sacred cave. Let your sacred cave breathe at night. I love that. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so I want I want to touch on a couple of things because you know I think people who haven't been immersed in this world or haven't had the experience and because this was me six years ago before my first thermography scan, I was like, okay, you're going to see heat in my body all day long. I'm walking around and there's heat in my body. So what? Why does heat matter? And why does heat correlate? to what does heat correlate to? We know that's inflammation. And then why is inflammation important as an indicator or a precursor to cancer? I mean, really quick before you answer that, I just want to share because it was so trippy. When I got my first scan, I was in the, in the midst of um, Invisalign. I was totally in the midst of Invisalign. And so maybe, oh, I wish I could, I wish I could pull it up and we could share it on YouTube, but um, I don't have that prepared. But my scan, my thermographist had me take a photo like this. And if you're watching on YouTube, what I'm doing is I'm looking up, my chin is up and my whole neck is exposed, right? And so my thermographist took that photo. And then when I saw it later, what Patricia explained as far as these, this coloring, it looked like a waterfall of red, orange, and yellow, like my fingers draining down my throat waterfall. And I had not told my thermographist about my ortho, you know, process. I hadn't said a thing about it. I didn't think to. And she asked me, are you in the, are you doing braces or night guard? Are you wearing Invisalign or anything like that? And I was like, yeah. And so anyway, it just was such a mind boggling experience to A, hear you say that and B, to actually witness and see that. Um, and I just went back, which is how Patricia, we got you here today. I just went back about a week or two ago to get my um, my follow up thermography scan, and I'm so excited because it's been a couple years since ortho. Uh, I'm excited to see what that looks like now and see if that's I would imagine reduced. But um, so yeah, so let's really make sure the listeners understand that how heat equals inflammation and how inflammation equals cancer. And I know I'm really dumbing it down there, but let's fill in the gaps for that okay. analogy. Well, you're right. Everything, not everything, but you know, um, things start in imbalances in our body start in inflammation. We know this like having the body on fire, kind of getting rust in our car, but you know, there can be all levels of inflammation, but when the cells all of a sudden start to replicate and it starts to become the beginning of cancer, the camera picks it up as a certain signature in Celsius heat. Mm. It's it's all based on, where's my camera? I don't have it here. It, it's all based on this camera, which is really a really expensive thermometer that's picking up the heat coming off the body, you know? Mm. And, and many times it will pick it up long before it picks up on a mammogram because a mammogram, an MRI, and an ultrasound is looking at anatomy. It can't measure heat. Mm-hmm. It can't measure heat. So... Um, but there's so many things that a woman can jump on top of with, I mean, and start to, to start to bring down the inflammation to, you know, start to take things to bring her breast back into balance to, uh, you know, start to build the immune system. I mean, there's just a plethora of things to do that is plant-based, you know, that's not toxic to the body. Yeah. Not toxic to the body. I've been involved in plant medicine since I really, since I was 18 years old. Mm-hmm. always in plant medicine those plants are always on the earth to take care of us yeah you had mentioned and i did a poor job of, of giving you all your your certifications and titles you know i know you're a certified thermography tech you're a whole health educator neuromuscular therapist and you had mentioned you are trained in foods as medicine mm-hmm. um, so i i love that the point is is when you're doing these scans, just because there's inflammation seen, it doesn't mean equals cancer. It means yeah, absolutely we not. Absolutely, we need absolutely. to pay attention to those and then start to monitor with alternative 
foods or chemical or um, not chemicals, but supplements <laughs> or, you know, different things that could actually help reduce inflammation in different areas of our body. So um, I know we have like this agenda that we want to get to. So let's try, let's shoot for like rapid fire and hit these four really controversial topics and really just give people enough to chew on and obviously want to get into your world and learn more because you are a plethora of knowledge. Let's hit first with that Lulu. What's going on with Lulu Lemon and what should we really as consumers know? Well, they've had a recall on a lot of their yoga pants and other companies because women are getting, um, getting vaginal problems and uterine problems because they're wearing the yoga pants without underpants, underwear panties. They're wearing it just straight onto their skin. And it's the petrochemicals in them. And a lot of them have the PFAS, the forever hormones. And actually, there's a lawsuit out on CoverGirl right now because they're going after a lot of the cosmetic industries, particularly California and Utah, because these are these are estrogen mimickers. This is really what my passion has been for the last 10 years is endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens. And what's interesting in thermography, going back to these petrochemicals, in thermography, you know, you had that gray scale, you have the color scale, the rainbow scale. And then there was one that looked like a black and white photograph. Mm -hmm. Well, that one in particular, and a lot of companies don't use that, it's called the grayscale. But estrogen dominance or hormonal backup will look like little spots on the body. And classically, it will look like leopard spots. If you were in front of a camera and you had a hot flesh, you would go totally leopard. Now, isn't that interesting? That's the sexy hormone. So who doesn't own a pair of leopard pants, a pair of leopard shoes, a leopard handbag? We're really feline, sexually mm -hmm. feline. But now we're seeing these same estrogen patterns on men, on young boys. But this is not coming from our hormones. It's coming from outside of our bodies called xenoestrogens or endocrine disruptors. And this is part of the gender dysphoria that we're seeing right now, or what's called fibrocystic breast or estrogen dominance. But there's beautiful things like sulforaphane that comes from the broccoli kingdom, from broccoli seeds. I mean, you can't eat it. It's actually a nutraceutical. It's in a capsule. But it can flush those receptor sites. Even children can take that to flush those receptor sites of those foreign hormones. So we're seeing this petrochemical epidemic. And you think about how many young girls cover their faces in makeup. Mm -hmm. It's in blush. It's in eyeshadow. It's in fake tan. It's in foundation. And they recall this lipstick I called Glamour or something that Madonna used to wear. It was my signature lipstick years ago. And I think they were making it out of Mexico and they had mercury in it. Mm. So they had to recall it. So makeup's very toxic, you know. So if you can't, if you can't eat it, don't put it on your body. So um Well, our young, our youth too, especially our youth, um, your teens, makeup wearing is happening earlier than ever, right? My neighbors and my cousins, da children, daughters are 9 and 11, 9 and 12 now, and uh, they're already getting into makeup. And the thing is, is once those teens and those preteens and then our young adults start going into the world and wanting to wear more and more makeup and buy more and more makeup, they're not buying expensive makeup. Sweet. They're not buying high-end quality makeup. They're buying the cheap stuff, which is going to be made with lesser quality in ingredients just for the price. But let me tell you that the original pink ribbon for Breast Cancer Awareness Month was a peach ribbon. And it was by a woman who had a, a grassroots group and she had the peach ribbon. And Estee Lauder came to her and said, well, let's team up. Let's have a, let's be together on breast cancer awareness. She said, no, I don't want to be a part of your system. And they stole the peach ribbon just like it is. And they made it pink and they said, sue us. So just because it's expensive makeup, I will tell you, I, as a makeup artist, I had a box of Chanel, Dior, you name it. My, sure. my makeup kit was expensive because I went for the pigment. Same chemicals are in, same foreign estrogens are in it. But you think of the ones that don't have the money and they're shopping at like dollar store or something. Oh my goodness. It's just so toxic what people are putting on their body. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really kind of shocking. I was in New Orleans for Christmas and my, my daughter's in-laws, wonderful people. They, they just love giving presents to all these little children. And all I see is petrochemical toys, petrochemical bedspreads, petrochemical um, baby clothing, petrochemical pajamas. 
it's, you can't even find cotton anymore. And yeah. another thing about cotton, cotton is not a food source. So they can spray anything on cotton, anything. Mm -hmm. Cotton can be so toxic. Sometimes you put on cotton, it's kind of itchy. But try to look for organic cotton. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can afford this. You know, we have to fight our battles. But you definitely want to be aware of what you put on, on your body. Yeah. And everything's in shrink wrap. Everything's in plastic. There was one woman and her daughter. She went off all plastics for two weeks. It was like she was in this bubble. Nothing came from plastic. She took everything to the store with paper bags. And her body burden dropped like 40% in two weeks. Oh, wow. Yes. And they did the same thing with young girls. And I forget the, how many weeks it was, but they got off mascara, cheek color, and foundation, and their body burden dropped significantly. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because because we're rapid firing here, what do we as consumers, right? We kind of pinpointed Lulu, uh, Lululemon here, but we're also talking about lots of other things, makeup, toys, clothing. Um, so what do we as consumers need to be looking for? I know you just mentioned one or organic, right? Organic cotton. What should we be either a looking for in a label or avoiding in a avoiding. label? Okay. They found that that the cans the, that are lined with BPA and 80% of the cans in our country have BPA lining. So if you're eating out of a can, like really, why are you never can? Unless it's coconut milk or maybe tomatoes or something, but look for organic and it'll say BPA free. You got to look, it'll say BPA free because they found just like at Duke university, when they exposed breast cancer cells to um, BPA and phthalates, they increased and proliferated. The same thing is with, the BPA that's in the cans, the linings of the cans. So I was trying to stay away from that. And can can um, we trust that the label saying BPA free is not just talking about the in, in what's inside the can? Can we trust that as a count for the can? Because like I see the, loopholes it's lining. It's the lining. I oh. listen, it's like, you know, even we have to be, we have to just really just look and just trust. But, you know, try to eat fresh, try to eat. I mean, some yeah. places are food deserts. It's, you can't even find organic food. Right. So, you know, if, if you can't eat organic, that's good. But um, my passion right now, and I really want to jump onto it, Let's is do it. the link between bras and breast cancer. Yeah, let's go there. Oh, we're going to go there. <laughs> um, I was very fortunate to make contact with Sidney Ross Singer, and he wrote a book called Dress to Kill, The Link Between Bras and Breast Cancer. He's a medical anthropologist. He has studied bras and limp and breast health around the world for over 20 years. And so he started making the link between bras and breast cancer. And in the beginning, the National Cancer Organization and um, in the bra industry, they were kind of like, well, how can we make it better? And then all of a sudden, oh, denied it, completely denied it. So let's just think out what is a bra doing to a woman? And as a thermographer, I see the backup all the time. So you think about a bra and you think about the whole industry, how they have told us how our, our breasts should look, how they should be pinched, pulled, set up. And the shame and, and what goes with a woman, well, my breasts are not perfect because they're not perky. They don't look a certain way because I've been told to have the perfect breast. It has to be this. Listen, I work for a couple of models, actually three, and I won't say one was, should I say who? You, do, you I don't do. know. I, I don't know. Well, anyway, she was. Don't get in trouble. Don't get in trouble. No, I don't want to say. She was very famous, married to a very famous politician, but I won't say. Okay. But anyway, they get breast implants and they can pay for it in one booking working for Victoria's Secrets. Two mm -hmm. bookings and it's paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, and now the thing about breast implants, if you don't take them out within 10 years, you get breast implant sickness. And that is really scary. You think you got Lyme, autoimmune, but going back to bras. So you think about the underwire. See mm -hmm. about the underwire. Mm -hmm. The underwire. I'm sitting here thinking, I just want to take mine off right now. Like that's yeah, what I'm yeah. thinking. <laughs> so the underwire, a lot of women are getting hip to the underwire, but it starts right at the sternum where there is a limp node that goes into the, um, into the, at, um, the digestive system. And then it stops at the top where the lymph nodes are. So if that bra is tight, it's holding those lymph nodes in place hour after hour, day after day, day after day. Now you go back 40 years. I mean, you look at the women in Victorian times, they were fainting because of the well bones that they couldn't breathe and they were breathing high into the chest and they were called nervous ninnies and they had fainting rooms for women because they couldn't breathe. So a bra can actually change the digestion of a woman because it's tight around the sternum 
where the lymph nodes goes into the digestion, breathing high into the chest, anxiety breath, chronically tight. But that limp on the outer quadrant of the breast and many of the cancers are found in the outer quadrant with lymph node involvement. So those lymph nodes are like little, they're like little vessels that pick up pesticides, environmental estrogens, all kinds of toxins, and they're supposed to flush out every day through movement. You know, it doesn't have a pump system like the, like the heart does with the blood. So when we are on a rebound or we're moving, we're moving our arms, our lymph will move. But a woman is in a bra almost 24 seven and she takes it off and goes to bed with no movement. Yeah. Now there's a very high percentage of a chance a woman will get breast cancer if she sleeps in bras. Two women have come to me, one just found out she had breast cancer. She had implants, slept in a bra every day. The other one slept with an underwire, both have breast cancer. Maybe, maybe not, but why take that chance? That means that lymph system is never flushed. Day after day, those toxins are being pointed at the breast. I mean, when you really think it out, it's a no-brainer because our lymph system, not only is it a modified sweat gland that we sweat and sweat it out, nobody really sweats anymore because we're kind of couch potatoes, but that bra is not letting our lymphatic system, our sewage system drain. Mm -hmm. So there are imminent lawsuits that are coming up. And you know who's going after the bra industry right now is Iran. Oh, interesting. Interesting, right? Iran. They said they're very, very progressive. And so are we just looking for, you know, uh, wire-free bras? Are we looking for bras with particular, like you said, 100% organic cotton? Are we going bra-free? Like what? A is lot of women are bra-free. The younger generation are going back like the hippies, ditch the bra. Mm -hmm. um, if a woman has to wear a bra because she's large busted. And here's the other thing. The size of the breasts are growing. When I was growing up in the 70s and the 60s, well, in the 60s, the average bra size was about a 34, 36 A, B, C. And now it can accommodate a double D, a double F. They're becoming huge because estrogen is called, um, fat is called the third estrogen or adipose tissue. So our breasts are fatty tissue. And all these estrogens that are coming in, they love to park on our breast. And you see men with these big estrogen bellies. You know, I had a gentleman that came the other day with his wife. And I said, hey, step in front of the camera, pull up your shirt. Ooh, it's covered with estrogen. He said, well, he said, I'm crying at movies and I don't have any strength anymore. I said, hormones. But anyway, that's another, that's another topic. But yeah. I, I, I can cover a lot of ground in no time at all. I know, you're doing great. But, but, um, but the bras, yes, there are bra extenders. If the bra leaves a, a red line around the body, the, 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 the rib cage, there are bra extenders. You can get them wide. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you're not wearing an underwire, sometimes they have like a little um, patch on the outer quadrant of the breast that gives the bra more stability. You know, um, if you want to be lifted, the lift is in the strap. We have been duped by what's called the droop. So 50 years ago in France, there was um, someone in the bra industry said that, you know, if you're wearing a bra every day, you're not using your ligaments and tendons and the breasts are going to sag. So I had a woman yesterday tell me she works for a holistic gynecology. She says, oh, I sleep with my bra every day because I don't want my breasts to droop. And they always show these women from Africa with pendulous breasts. I mean, really? That's not what our breasts are going to look like if we don't wear a bra. Mm. But, you know, I mean, not everybody can go braless. Yeah. But it has to be soft fitting, not tight. Okay. And as soon as you get home fluff up the breasts. Our breasts are pendulous. They run a degree or two cooler. And, you know, massage the breast. Um, breasts love um, castor oil. Breasts love iodine. You know, really come home to your breast. Really come home to the breast and, and be braless as much as possible. But don't just go straight into bed without, you know, without your bra because the lymph system hasn't moved all day. Yeah. That's such and a good, good reminder. I'm thinking, well, at least we're getting, you know, our eight hours of no bra time. But then you said, but we're just literally laying there. We're not actually just, just laying there getting that movement. Um, I, I want to I go back to those, those, um, that Invisalign real quick, because yeah. I've been collecting a series of them. And I had a little boy that came in, he was 14 years old, he had an Invisalign. Now, classically, I said, estrogen will look like leopard spots, right? So he had leopard spots all around his face. 
he had thick drainage going down his left chin into his breast, growing breast. He had gynecomastica. He was growing breast. Oh, my goodness. And so is that because our bodies, when we're doing treatment or we're making change, the inflammation comes in? I'm, to my knowledge is inflammation comes in to act as like a – it invigorates the cells because something's moving, right? So right. that's why we see more inflammation if we're moving our teeth because – the body is natural response. No. Okay, yeah, fill, no. fill that in. It's, it's that the, the, the Invisalign is a plastic. It has the BPA. It has the the estrogen chemicals in it. It has the um, oh. it's, it's, it's the estrogen that's in the plastics that's making so, his breast grow because it's a hormone disruptor. So we don't see those same that same experience if we're doing the, um, br braces like traditional braces. Are we no, seeing no, that? You don't. You don't. And I, mouth guard. I had a woman the other night with a mouth guard, and it went straight into her right nipple, straight into the right nipple. But wow. I was just seeing a biological dentist um, just the other day, and I said, "What's in those Invisaligns?" He said, "By law, they don't have to tell us." Mm. They don't have to tell us. And I have another friend who's a biological dentist. I said, what's in those Invisalign? She said, we don't know. But they're so, plastic. So I heard that there's an alternative, right? Because A, either people listening are either going through some sort of ortho treatment and possibly using plastics, um, or they're an adult with a mouth guard. So what are our alternatives? If we want to keep our you know, teeth and jaw, <laughs> the investment we've made, like what alternatives are out there? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, mouth guards, a lot of people use mouth guards not to snore. There's something called Somafix, S-O-M-A-F-I-X. There's mouth tape to keep your mouth closed at night so you don't snore. Um, you know, I, I don't know the question is, and I'm going to see my dentist tomorrow so I can follow up with you. In biological dentistry, in Switzerland, where they're so ahead of their game, they're using um, more biological biologically friendly um, things in the mouth, like, you know, the amalgams and the, and the, uh, uh, whatever they call those dental things that holds the teeth in place. I can't think of the word. Um, well, anyway, they're using, they're using safer products. They're okay. using safer products. But, yeah. Um, yeah, that's but, interesting. I'd love to see the results because it says you're, you said you're collecting. So I'd love to see the results of those collections and kind of what you, you do study wise with it. Um, hysterectomies, we talked about the increase in like, dare I say the trend of just getting a hysterectomy because I don't want a period anymore. And that's happening younger and younger. Like what's going on with that? Well, we're seeing an increase in hormonal imbalances. Young women, some women are starting menopause in their late twenties, early thirties. Um, there's one in six couples can't conceive now because the sperm count has dropped so low. And again, men are uh, their estrogen has increased by forty five percent. Their testosterone's dropping, and that's why we're seeing a lot of feminization of men. Um, there's five hundred and fifty thousand hysterectomies a year from heavy bleeding. They're not trying to turn it around. Polycystic ovarian syndrome that's estrogen driven. I have great results with women who do iodine douches because when there's not enough iodine in the body, the estrogens becomes um, it becomes uh, not disrupted, but it becomes imbalanced. And without enough iodine, there's uterine fibroids, fibrocystic breast, cyst on the ovaries, um, breast uh, problems, thyroid problems, prostate problems, pancreatic issues. And this is what happened in the late 60s and 70s. They took iodine out of our milk, out of our they told people to stop having table salt. There was a little bit of iodine, just not have a goiter. And they took it out of our bread. You know, one little slice of Wonder Bread, a person got all their iodine. And then 10 years later, all the endocrine disorders started dovetailing. Again, fibrocystic breast, uterine fibroids, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, thyroid issues. But guess what? They can't patent an element. They can't patent iodine mm. and they put it on the back burner and they demonized it just like they did with thermography because they demonized it. They put it in a fear mode. Oh, it's, it's a woo woo science. They can't tell. Well, you know what? They would find something on a thermography and 10 years later, the cancer would come up. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the industry. It's, it's false advertising. So our breasts thrive on iodine as, as the rest of us. And someone has 
fiber um, Hashimoto's you know they still need iodine with their minerals selenium but you have to get a doctor and most doctors the biggest question mark out there is the thyroid and endocrinology is not a science that I would trust and that's a whole other story of working with bio bioidentical hormones but I will say there's a woman, Lindsay Berkson, she wrote several books. One's called um, Hormone Deception. She was on the think tank for 15 years at Tulane University on all the environmental estrogens and all the stuff we're seeing. Then she wrote a book called Smart Women, Safe Hormones. And she addresses, she is such an erudite, all the studies of hormones all over the world. They did a study, 7 million woman study at NIH. It's not peer reviewed yet. And it was followed by insurance companies that older women need natural estrogen, need natural estrogen, not um, synthetic hormones like birth control pills. They need natural estrogen that it had a 75% decrease in dementia. And this was covered, this was followed by insurance companies, 73% in Parkinson's. But we are in a hormone, um, uh, it's just there's a there's there's just so much fear and ignorance and misinformation about bioidentical hormones, but they're used in Europe and they they give them away to women. They give them. <laughs> Dropped your microphone. <laughs> My microphone. There you are. There you are. Now it's interesting that you know you know what oxytocin is. It's the feel good hormone. You know, mm -hmm. like when a woman has a baby and everything. It's called the cuddle hormone. You can actually get it at at Walmart and you squirt it up your nose. And they're using it in um, Denmark to save marriages. They have such a high divorce rate. They can't get past five years. And they're using it to, to bring marriages back together. It's a cuddle hormone. So my boyfriend, we do it twice a day. He calls it snot juice and sniffs. <laughs> well, that's a real turn on if you call it snot juice. <laughs> snot juice. Well, that's what he calls it. but. You know, but yeah, I mean, whatever it's, works. It's a puddle hormone, isn't that amazing? So yeah. all these hormones that were there, and then you see, you see on 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 ads why so many women are losing their hair. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? That mm -hmm. oh yeah, hair. That's hormonal imbalance. You have to look at the DHT. That's the part of the testosterone of checking mm -hmm. that. But why is so many women? Ten years ago, women weren't losing their hair. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all hormonal imbalance that's coming from the petrochemical industry. So we as consumers and humans and listeners of this episode, we need to really educate ourselves on hormones just in general, like what what's natural, what we have, what we're blocking. Because like <clears throat> one of my close friends who's going through the early stages of their cancer journey right now are being put on estrogen blockers. So like... Again, I know we're running out of time, but my, my brain tells me, you know, is that the right course? Is that the gold standard that we're just following because that's what we're following? Or is that really helping? Um, I don't know if we have time to go into that, but what is well, I will that? say that I will say that Dr. Lindsay Berkson, who wrote Smart Women Safe Hormones, she does address that, that we really do need those hormones. And just to show how this whole industry is being ratted out, basically, they just found through artificial intelligence they can see when something was plagiarized they can see when something was copy and pasted that dana farber the big cancer hospital treatment center up in boston over 30 studies have been fabricated on cancer oh. all to benefit the pharmaceutical industry and they are going in as science to harvard and so they have to retract all these studies so they're going to do it i don't know but it was actually caught by a gentleman in london Oh my goodness. That's good. That's good. That that's getting caught. Okay. We have one more rapid fire. Okay. And we're going we're gonna to have a little longer episode guys, but I think this is, I mean, all of us, you know, men and women, this is pertinent for all, all of us. So the last thing though, that we wanted to talk about was that we're seeing an increase overall increase in breast cancer in our younger women. Absolutely. What is younger? What ages are you seeing? What's, what was average 50 years ago and what are we seeing now? And what are the what are the thoughts in your industry in the thermography world on how we can turn this around? Okay, um, in the last ten years, it's now one in eight women are getting breast cancer, and eight out of ten of those are becomes uh, because of toxins. And they said there's going to be a thirty percent increase in cancer across the board, all cancers by the year two thousand thirty. 
the operative word there, the takeaway, is that eight out of 10 are from toxins. We have to detox the body. We have to be diligent in what we're doing. The breast loves sulforaphane. Take your bra off. Be kind to your breast. Don't, don't uh, do lymphatic drainages, but stay away from, um, you know, actually red meat. And coffee, coffee is actually great for some breasts. People like that, but it can make breasts very sensitive. And I've, and Shanna had one too, the one that you're a thermographer. Mm -hmm. um, two women came in, they, they were coffee addicts and they were covered in estrogen. Coffee turns to estrogen in 45 minutes. Oh, wow. And then it takes a month or two, you know, to get the estrogen out. But, you know, with a tender, lumpy breast, that even a gynecologist says get off coffee. So what I'm seeing, I mean, 15 years ago or something, it was one in 11 women were getting. 50 years ago, it was we weren't seeing much breast cancer. We weren't seeing it because we're seeing it from the petrochemical industry that is a direct link to our breast cancer. Direct link. And, oh, the other one is that um, you never hear of inflammatory breast cancer. That's just heat. could never be found on a mammogram. But it, the BPA, the phthalates, has an effect on those cancer cells, and it proliferates, and a woman can get uh, inflammatory breast cancer from this, these phthalates. Mm. And they will never be found on a mammogram because it's heat. It has to be found mm. on a thermogram or becomes so, become so over the top that it's full-blown cancer, and then it can be seen. But we want to. We don't. We don't want to focus on cancer. We want to focus on breast wellness. You know how we can keep our breast healthy. You get a thermography. It's a no-brainer. See the condition of your breast. Follow up with an ultrasound, and do a breast protocol. They can contact me. I have a breast protocol. I get great results in six months. Or just, you know, I can't talk enough about sulforaphane that comes from the broccoli seed, and that's been studied at Johns Hopkins as a um, inhibits breast cancer cells. You can't eat 40 pounds of broccoli. I wouldn't be in, want to be in the room with you if you did. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Agreed. So, Agreed. <laughs> you said so what, are, what are our, like, I don't know if rights is the right word, but right in our medical system, I know, I know that, I mean, maybe there are, maybe I'm wrong, but I know my insurance doesn't cover thermography. Right. No, they jump, they jump to mammogram, even on ultrasound. If I want an ultrasound, I, I think there's hoops I have to jump through to get that. Yes, so, you're absolutely right. So to kind of wrap us up, and I know we had to break blaze through these quickly, but since we are seeing an increase in breast cancer in our women, younger and younger and younger, how can we advocate for ourselves? What powers do we have within our system or what do we need to do to combat that or get around it to really take this serious? Obviously I heard thermography scan, get that. But and you know what? It's not that expensive. I mean, it, it, it runs about three, three fifty. And what do you spend on a, a good bottle of wine? You go out to lunch and you eat, get a good pair of shoes. I mean, you know, really a good pair of shoes is at least one hundred and fifty dollars. You got to right. really think about where you're spending. Where's your priority? Right. I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to prioritize your health. I because think one of these, which I think I've heard have, are full of BPA, so I probably need to stop drinking out of this thing. But I think one of these is $65. And, and how many of us are toting around these fancy water bottles that are just killing us, but then not spending whatever, $350? Well, that's, that's a good question. Is that just aluminum or is, that, is there BPA in that lining? I just heard, I heard this particular brand, I'm not going to shame them, but I heard this particular brand that's been really popular right now is getting a lot of heat because there is some product in this. I think maybe it's lead. Maybe they're finding lead in it. So maybe I'm mixing oh chemicals here, but um, as I'm sitting here sipping off of it, but I just, my point was we spend a lot of money in frivolous ways and maybe even ways that are harming us. But yet to your point, like, I do the full body scan and I need to do it more frequently, but I do the full body scan because cancer is everywhere, but yes, definitely prominently here. But at the, the, because of we're seeing the rise, because we're seeing the rise, save up, skip, skip on a pair of shoes or here or there, save up and get at least that breast scan. Absolutely. Um, get proactive and get altern start exploring alternative options. And I think my thing I see, start thinking about is right. Every, Every person, every specialist is going to have their, dare I say, agenda or dare I say their own personal experiences on what we can do. So mm -hmm. just take control of your own rights and health and advocate for alternatives. Don't, if the doctor says you have to do X, Y, and Z, don't feel like you can't say, well, is there an A, B, and C? 
that's in our right as humans to question. Right. Particularly, research. particularly if a woman has dense breast. Yeah. And how do we, how do we know if we have dense breasts? Like, well, dense breasts are usually quantified through a mammogram, sometimes an ultrasound, but you know, women that are, you know, usually by the age of 40, they're going to start pushing a mammogram, mm -hmm. but a lot of women have opted for no mammograms because they don't want radiation. Yeah. So just know that, you know, 50, 49% of women have dense breasts. So what? Right. But it will, it can't be seen on, on a, on a thermography. It's just looking at heat, just mm -hmm. looking at that, that heat sensitivity. Yeah. But it is a, a huge industry, dense breast and mammograms. Well, but, Patricia, I'm, I want to respect all our listeners, your time, the calendar. Um, what, what's a good kind of end note? I'd love to kind of just wrap up like your thoughts about this. What should listeners make sure they took away if nothing else from this episode? And then how can people get into your world and find you to learn more? Well, I think that um, really come home to your breasts. There's a lot of shame around our breasts, particularly touching our breasts. And, you know, how do we relate to our breasts? There's a lot of women I'm dealing with that are going, having to deal with past trauma. Trauma is a serious thing. I mean, you just think that we're teased, we were called flat chested, big this. I mean, this goes back a long way. Oh, I want to ask you, if your breasts could talk, what would they say? You want to actually ask me? Yeah, what would your what would you say? What if your breasts could talk, what would they say? <laughs> Let me free. I'm 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 the one who wears the bra all the time. I am the total all the time wears a bra. Um, that is that's totally me. So that's it hit home. That's why it hit home so much when you said we're 24 seven, like constricting those lymph nodes from doing their job. And so I think, yeah, they'd say, let me free. Yeah, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had and you think about we put little girls in training bras. And my friend who is, you know, she's the she has a yoga center and everything. And she's torn because they're already teasing this little girl about her nipples showing mm. wrong, wrong, wrong. Our breasts are monetized, they're sexualized, they're shamed, they're glorified. Why? We have so much around our breast. And little girls, we're going to start sh shutting them down. They're not going to be able to feel their chest and they're going to be compacted and they're going to start from an early age of no limp drainage. Mm -hmm. Training bras for children. Yeah. I mean, just even the word training bra, it just kind of almost feels so commercialized. Like we're going to start training what you think you should do and be I and think, look like. I think we should start training those jock straps for men with wires underneath them. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So how can people get into your world? I already mentioned the book. We'll make sure that we have a link to your website, but what's the, the other, where else are you hanging out so that people can interact and learn from you? Well, I live in New York City, and my best thing would be to reach me on my website, patricialucardi.com. And the company that I'm with is Breast Thermography International, BTI Scan. We have labs all over the country. Try to use us because we're the best, but if that all fails, anything's better than nothing. But thermography, you want to get a live time of what your breasts look like. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been thank incredibly, you. yes, incredibly insightful, personal. We all have someone that we know that's going through cancer and we probably all have someone who's going through breast cancer specifically. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start advocating for ourselves, advocating for each other, get to know your breasts, talk with your breasts, ask them that important question of what would they say? And, yeah. uh, hit up Patricia, go to patricialucardi.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes. And again, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. Until next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Passion on Purpose podcast. I truly hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. So if you did, please rate, review, and share. If you are interested in being a guest on the show, whether a leader or an expert, please go to getvim.com forward slash podcast and you will find our application page or reach out to me directly and I can give you more information. 